You can now follow me on all my social media platforms to find out who my latest guest will be. And don't forget to click the subscribe button and the notifications button so you're notified for when my next podcast goes live. I spent a big part of my life trying to put faces to the cock you were sucking when you were a kid, when you're like fucking seven. You know what I mean? Which is kind of some dark shit. And you're like, you know, you've, you've, there's adults that are, are, are empowering themselves. And I remember being taken by an adult, by a, by a fostered stepbrother, taking me to a place and leaving me with adults. When you get a record deal, the point being is, we just go fucking mad. What about all the cars and the gold and the jewelry? Because I feel that I want to fill it and just go, I've made it. And then you think, you're a fucking idiot. Because it's Monopoly money. Doesn't take your pain away. It doesn't take the pain away. And I'm there at five in the morning trying to find the last bit of gear in the fucking carpet and trying to call every fucking dealer. This is the bird that was fucking nonsense me. It was an adopted fucking sister who was older than me and I had no control. So I, she said to me, you would, you know, and it's this moment that stays with me that was like, oh, fucking hell. I think that witnessing her die in that car and the ambulance isn't coming. I think that's, I think the repercussions of that have already proven. One of the main yardies was, who was always coming for goals, was one of our diamond setters. Then why come on, you make a fuck them, I'm going to go kill them, block, block up, why didn't And this guy was off his head all the fucking time. Bad man. And I remember being on the phone on, on the bottom of 121st Terrace, hearing shots down the road, thinking, rah, rah, I was on the phone with my bird in England. And the next thing you know, I put the phone down, and then Orlando turns up, he's like, yo, fucking Jackson's been ironed out. And we go down the block and it's like, his fucking head's, he's been fucking just been shot. His fucking head's on the interior. All the interior of his car is just red. Bring it on. Bring it on. <laughs> <laughs> it's been a while. I've yeah. had so many people say to me, because being in Thailand, you kind of end up separating yourself and going, got to do James English, man. Really shit out there. Got to do James. Yeah, appreciate you for coming on. Legend, Get Goldie, AKA, what's the real name? Is it Clifford Joseph Price? Clifford Joseph Price. Price. Yeah. So yeah. There you yeah, go, I'll celebrating make that. Make a toast to that. It's yeah. only when you go out and when you get some kids going up to you going, hey, Clifford, can I speak to you? I'm like, mate, you call me Clifford one more time, <laughs> I'm gonna give you the back of my fucking hand. Uh -huh. You know, because my mom was always a thing about, it's the real, the ultimate, this is like, not even on my hand, people that call me that. Like my, I can hear my mom's voice when, she, when I hear the name. My wife, of course, Cliffy. Do you know what I mean? Because he's kind of really endearing. And there's a few older people like Drax or Lawrence Who from Bristol. You know what I mean? They go, Cliff. And I don't take offense to it because I feel they're very close to me. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, it's been a mad, mad journey. I mean, obviously our connection is Scotland, the Gorbals. Yeah. A bit weird. Uh, yeah, yeah. When I spoke to you on the phone, you says that. I, I never expected that. Your mum's Scottish. <laughs> My mum's from the Gorbals originally, no longer there. So bless everyone in Scotland. You know, it's the only accent I can't do. I'm pretty good at accents, really. But just the idea of, you know, I was always going to be fucked up if my mum come from the Gorbals, had, had a loads of sisters in the family, fell in love with a black man, father was an alcoholic, hated a fucking gush because you're seeing a nigger, getting thrown out of Scotland to go and work in a pub in Leeds, and she met my dad. That was never going to be easy, was it? Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Man of many talents, though. Musician, author, actor, <laughs> graffiti artist. Like, the list is long for, for your achievements, and... The drum and bass, like, you changed the game there. 1996, you won the best album at the Mobiles up against some absolute superstars. It's phenomenal achievement, but your life goes deep, brother. I believe this chat will go deep. You come from a lot of pain and misery. You're doing your own. We all have demons, we all battle, including today. You're working on them. You became a different animal. Your energy's changed. Your energy's shifted. It's a beautiful thing to see. But I always go back to the start with my guest, brother, where you grew up and how it all began. Yeah, I just think it was, I just think it was, um, I really see, like, in all film that I look at now, what's my purpose and where I've come from, kind of people know the story, but they don't, they obviously can't feel it because you're there. But it was always fractured. I always had memories of Freudian, you know, being in the care system from a really early age and going all around the reeking. But you know, that, that small violin, the strings are worn out, it don't work anymore. <laughs> It's really bad. 
Fucking glad. All that stuff, you know. I used to, I used to throw stones after my brother, Melvin. Because we never really got on. But, you know, I, I had to realise the pain he went through. Because my mother, we were like three years apart, me and Melv. So he was with me, Mum. While she was getting the fucking, you know what I mean, from all of the lovers that like to fucking knock her about. You know, you'd be in the pub while she's scoring. Do you know what I mean? While she's waiting for him to come back. You know, and, and it's really weird because some weekends, when I finally got to find out who she was and remember who my mother was, I remember there's a period of from 16 to, to 18, knowing where she was, which seemed like a town that was too far away. You know, she's in Warsaw and you're like in Wolverhampton. That's oh, far, it's a bus ride. You know what I mean? It's like from here to, from Battersea to Wandsworth. Do you know what I mean? It's, it's nothing. And you kind of realise that you'd go there and I'd go and find this Scottish woman. Oh, here's a little woman called Maggie. She lives on the top balcony, Cherville Rise. And you go and meet her and she's this small Scottish woman. Just, just, oh, I wonder when you were going to come. Like it was nothing. Come on, let's have a cup of tea. And it's just this weird feeling you get. But you, you know, you, you be, you've come from being in a care home where every piece of clothing's got your name in it, Clifford Price. You know, on your clothes, that you've got a pile of, and that's your clothes, that's your lot. So it's almost like post borstal stuff. And then when you go home, you realise that your brother's nicking all your shit because he's younger than you, and he's Rastafarian, and he's got a bird up the duff who's about to give birth. And you're like, what, what, what life is this? It's a different kind of fucking ghetto life. And you, you come to it on the fence like some some really fucked up version of Kez. Like, you're not black, you're not white, you're on the fence, you're seeing all this mad stuff, like you, you're buying a two pound drawer from Pops down the road and you, you know, you're ticking out the seeds from the weed and you, you know, you're looking at all these ways to hustle and make a, make a pound note. And your idea of Rastafarian is that you don't eat animal fat, but yet you can pimp. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? In our family anyway, not, not, not giving Rastafarian a bad name. But, you know, the idea of getting locked up and putting beeswax in your hair and becoming a Rasta and 20, 30 July getting fucking stoned, listening to fucking dub music. You know, it was a really mad upbringing. And um, I wouldn't change a fucking thing about it. You know, but, and I think most, most versions of me are not far off what every fuck has gone through, really, when you think about this. I think one of the biggest dropouts of this pandemic is the amount of traumatic... Ex, uh, you know, experience we're loading onto these new young people. And the adults that are supposed to be running the government aren't really giving a fuck. Yeah. They really forgot that they were young. You know what I mean? I, and that's what I find really discouraging that these people that are running, whether it's Labour or Conservative, it's better the devil you know, whichever one we're looking at. But it just seems like the people that are running it, it's a bit of a feeble excuse of, of human course, beings. It's divide and conquer, isn't it? Everybody's just drowned with fear. It, scare, it scares me how people are so easily manipulated by fear, but I guess that's the human body. We're all easily scared off from many different things in life. I think mm. people are really scared for their life and you've just got to kind of push through it and keep swimming because a lot of people are sinking at the moment and it, is, mm. it does scare me because it's just a fucking weird time f to be alive. But again, we will but push it, but through it. But here's the thing, here's the thing though. Think about it in terms of the spirituality. I'm 55. I've had the greatest years I've put behind me. I'm in the return movement. And the return movement is where you shrink a little bit, <laughs> keep yourself fit, and you, you kind of get this other respect, but you are on your way out, yeah, respectively. But, but as soon as we're born, we start to die. It's just how, yeah. you, how you want you, to die. Yeah, we just, it's, there's, a great, there's a great album. I remember the track, um, it was by a guy called Clute, and it says, we are all dying. That's the title of the track, yeah. from the very get-go. And I think there's one of those mantras I always say, as an artist, you are burning, you're beginning your burn. You are either at your hottest point or you're burning out. That's it, just fucking burn. No matter which way you go about it, that's your job. But thinking about it from the bigger picture, which is my own belief system, is that, you're only here for a small moment. And it's such a small moment of time, which is something that we kind of made up, the experience of being here. I'm in an experience. It's that T-shirt. You know, I am a spiritual being have a very, having a very human experience. And it's a really, it's, it's, it's stayed with me. It's a guy, guy called Bob Frisnell, who was the, 
you know, the original conspiracy theorist, which, you know, could put you down a rabbit hole if you smoke compulous amounts of weed. Um, not, you know, don't look into it too deeply. However, it was a thing that I'd always, I'd always loved the way that it was this idea of being a spiritual being, having a human experience. And the point I'm making is, imagine if you had social media in the 15th century when the bubonic plague was here, how the news would look. Bubonic plague and everyone is dying by the millions, the skin's falling off their faces and it's, it's like, guys, get a fucking grip. The thing that makes this worse isn't down to just conspiracy. It's down to we're fucking human beings and we're fucking stupid and we just have a massive sense of entitlement. It's people's reactions. We, it's, well, entitlement. Mm -hmm. We have the sense that, no, no, we're bigger than this and we should all... It's like, guys, it was here before us. And you think in that little fucking time frame that, that, that this really strong COVID, extremely strong in the beginning, killing people in the beginning, weakening in itself like pandemics do, strain, making all kinds of different variants, which you want to get one, 150 pounds on the way in because the government's rubbing their hands together and some cunt in the middle is taking a piss out of both parties because you're both stupid. The idea that the variant will, what happens to, this is what happens to viruses. They mutate and they go crazy at first because they want to live. Like, you know, when you get to make a film about alien and you're strangling alien and it breaks off and its arm creates another creature, but we kill it in the end. The idea is, no, we can't fucking fly, guys. So you can watch all the superhero films you fucking like. Again, a sense of entitlement that we can do all of these things. The pandemic was here before. It's been here many, many times. So I don't want to hear it, because if the government wanted to fucking kill you, believe me, they could sprinkle shit over you at night, you wouldn't even fucking know, and you'd all be dead. <laughs> they need too much money in the beginning, because that's like, it's like the mafia. Why burn burning shop down? We can just make money on the way, slowly. You yeah. know, those, the, those, the days of people lining up and marching into war are finished. So going back to your point at the beginning of the conversation, if your great, great fan, fan grandfather made potatoes and you worked for him, no plagues, plagues, he's in between plagues. And you're picking potatoes and you've got a wife. That's all you do. And you die, he dies. And then you watch, you know, your family grow and then you die. And it's, but you just pick potatoes. It's a fucking great time to be alive right now. You're witnessing three or four decades all slamming into each other. Computers, science, all f men are flying with suits. I tried it badly. Men are going to Mars. You know, people have kind of gone to Mars for 27 billion when you could have fed a lot of shit. I mean, I've got to, I, I've got to say, I'm sorry, man. Outright, you're a complete cunt. If you can spend 27, one person going to space, you're a cunt. If I had 27 fucking mil, and you're not spending it on, the, on fucking the planet, and people, sorry, you're a cunt. Or show me that you spent 27 million already with poverty in the world and world problems, and you spent 27 going to Mars. You're a complete cunt. <laughs> I don't want to hear it. Um, but the idea for me is that being in these times to witness this stuff, I've witnessed five different versions of myself in one lifespan. I'm all right. Because getting it right, or to the best of my ability, I want to be the best version of myself today I can possibly be. I've had people come on my feed, and my feed's open on, on Instagram. Oh, you're a complete cunt. Tell me something I don't know. <laughs> like, you're not going to... And you're, I'm going to unfollow you. You unfollowing me, please, please do. I'm going to unfollow you now. You unfollowing me does not change my fucking life. Yeah. It doesn't change the love for my child. It doesn't change the fact... In, in fact, mm. I hope it fuels you with a vendetta to want to do good and want to go on to prove that guy wrong that I should be entitled and get to the very top. And I'm not here to be your personal fucking trainer in music. Tell me what you think of these 25 demos. No, tell me what you think of them, because you made them. I'm not here to tell you what I think of your music. And I think it was a really great quote that I'd heard from Alex Turnbull's father about, you know, the idea that if you, if it's not good enough for you, that's all it's got to be good for. 
don't give a fuck about anyone else. Yeah, that's the best way. And I just stopped giving a fuck. It's difficult though because people say, I'll, I'll post something and people say, oh, that's it, I'm unsubscribing and I'm unfollowing, but I ain't a fucking airport. I could not give a fuck about your departure. Like, I do not care. See, I, when, I like that. I could not give a fuck about your departure. So see when you say there's five different versions of yourself this life, is that trying to figure out what one suits you to take you away from your pain or one what suits you where you're the, at yeah, peace the, or what? The, How does that pain, work? Yeah, the pain factor in the different versions. You know, I've been an addict for 35, 40 years. Or 35, well, 35 years. And you have to work on it like every day. You've got to work on it. I've got to fucking meditate like sometimes twice a day. Whether it's TM, you know, yoga's becoming another physical meditation to keep you from the distractions. You know, I'm out and I'm just dodging people. You know, I'm fucking dodging and ducking and diving. And you always got to work on it. Excuse me. The idea that my pain is not anyone else's and the idea of what I've gone through traumatically, you know, doing, you know, EMDR treatment because you're trying to put, you, you know, I've spent, I've spent a big part of my life trying to put faces to the cock you were sucking when you're a kid, when you're like fucking seven. You know what I mean? Which is kind of some dark shit. And you're like, you know, you've, you've, there's adults that are, are empowering themselves. And I remember being taken by an adult, by a, by a fostered stepbrother, taking me to a place and leaving me with adults in a fucking weird shed. And you're like, that wasn't fucking right. But it took me a long time to work out this isn't right. And then, you know, you're dealing with that stuff. And I think the EMDR, I'd have to go back to this shed and work out what wallpaper's in there and how to fucking dismantle it and take it apart. You know, and then you've got to look at the Hoffman process, which I think was, I think the Hoffman process was a very big point because the Hoffman doesn't kick in. My son, Danny, God bless him. Danny did the Hoffman and, he, and I said to him, it takes a year. You know, imagine being my first son and you didn't know I was his dad, which was a lot of pain that he had to deal with. Out of all my kids, he had to deal with the fact that he was lied to, that I wasn't, you know, I wasn't his dad. And, you know, all of a sudden it's his character that's his fucking dad, that's larger than life. Um, and he's found his own place now on, on, on his, on his, on his, in his life and what he's doing. But the point is, you know, the Hoffman process was, was important because... What is the Hoffman process? Well, the Hoffman's like, it, it, it's a guy called Bob, great name, Bob. Uh, Bob Hoffman, who, 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 had the, who devised this whole kind of quadrant way of looking at your life, like looking at the East and the West together. And it's all right when you, you know, sorry, Eric Clapton, give my fucking 18 grand back, you twats, because, you know, I went to fucking rehab in Antigua and all I've got is people trying to make me cross the road when I see a pub and whipping me for their sins. I get it. That works for some people. So just for the record, um, Eric, I still want my 18 grand back. Um, it doesn't work for me. And when you get a guy berating you saying you're 30 seconds late for a fucking lesson and sends you back to your room, I've already been in the establishment all my life to be an adult and then be an adult while another guy's trying to tell me the same shit that I was dealing with 20 years prior. I get it. You've had a bad day. Don't take your 20 second lateness out on of, out of me. But then when you do that and you come to someone's room at rehab, and barge into his space, which is supposed to be your space, I'm gonna wind you out. There you go, I'll get you, you know, and you're out. So I've got, you know, what happens yeah. next is I have to leave because you got, you know, you got a little bit of fisticuffs and, you know, ironed out one of the, uh, the people. This is all to do with different ways. You know, for example, that way of rehab works for some people, but for me, the Hoffman's the only one that's ever worked because the model's got to change. There's got to be new ways of treating mental illness with these kids now, right? Post, you know, post COVID. These kids trapped in a fucking room, doing what they've got to do and staying in. Mate, I would have stayed in in the 80s, you know, in the 90s, staying with a PlayStation at home, just smoking weed. Brilliant, I'd stay in all day long. Yeah. And I haven't got to go to school. Yeah. It depends on which way you look at it, right? Yeah, <laughs> I think social media plays a part. I think people, <laughs> I think they think everybody's living their best life that they're missing something, but there's nothing really fucking changed. People, it's just people are looking at the world differently. That's why the mental health, the depression's rising, the drug abuse, yeah. I mean, everything's rising because people are, everything in their mind is, everything in here, it's you that's sending you fucking nuts and yeah, crazy. You're sending, you're sending, it, sending, yeah, you're sending the messages. Yeah, it's scary. Is that when your abuse started, Goldie, at seven years old? I think the, 
I think he started way before way before that. He stayed a little bit, a little bit of time before then, but I couldn't remember. It's only when you do the treatments, you start getting this stuff that you think, nah, it didn't it was it wasn't, and it didn't happen. You know, you know, like you look at when you start to break it down. I used to be really angry with males in traffic. Like, I come out of yoga and I fucking get into road rage. I want to iron some geezer out in the traffic lights. You know, you get you you know fucking like a club in the end because he's just like fucking start banging people out. Or getting banged out and getting smacked up just because I was angry with fucking male characters. And then I think it's because when you're young, you, you were controlled by these adults that you couldn't control. So it just made me angry because I didn't know who they were. Um, but you could become this other thing. You start driving through it. And I used to be really homophobic because of uh, sexual abuse as a kid. But then you realize that, you know what I mean? Like we got into Tony's thing, right? One of the fucking most amazing human beings on the planet. And I've seen Tony at his fucking like, he's going to die tonight. His fuckers looks like he's going to die tonight. <laughs> to being like, oh, yeah, I love Tony. He's, he ain't going to fucking die. And he, I mean, he's, one, he's survived and lost a lot of people. And I used to be really homophobic. And you know, it's weird how the Hoffman, I got placed in a room with a gay guy. And I'm really homophobic because I had to work through that process because of abuse from males. So I was like, fucking stay away from me. You know, so, so all of these Freudian experiences, you start to be broken down by it. And I think the Hoffman's a really good model because of the way that it works through the process because everyone's trying to unpack the box. But the problem with the box is that when you take things out of the box, how is the box made? I don't know what's in the fucking... I know what's in the box. It's fucking this and that. But I want to know how the box was made. It was constructed by, oh, fuck, empathy for my mother. My dad was Jamaican. He's coming go, go to England. He's got loads of birds on the end of his dick. He's happy. He's not a one man guy. He's not a one woman guy. He's gonna be blazed. When he's from an island. He's got a big yeah. dick. He's banging birds. See when you're getting through that sort of abuse though, when male that being bastards and horrible cunts, does that also make you question your own sexuality because you're being forced upon something? You you, you become confused of what the fuck is really going on. Is yeah, that- I became I became really um, I just became really angry, and I, I kind of, I kind of you know you, you, it's all right me blaming like for example Saturn's Return is a documentary it's very dark, but I think even that's an abuse of power because I had lots of money, lots of wealth you know richness of you know Ferraris Bentleys all on the driveway, lots of cars five at one point there was five cars on the driveway. And I always remember the idea of being young and, and you drop the football and it rolls onto someone's drive and there was a scimitar, all dusty, on someone's driveway and the ball rolled underneath and all the curtains are closed. I'm looking up at the house thinking, it's a fucking beautiful day. I'd be driving that sports car. You know, what you know, and you get the ball and you think, is there anyone live, who lives there? And I remember being off my tits been on a fucking five day bender and I look out the window and there's a kid holding a ball at the end of the driveway looking at five cars thinking and I'm like fuck it close the window paranoid <laughs> you know, I'm off my head it's three in the afternoon thinking what the fuck am I doing man I'm doing the same shit over and over again and I kind of got sick of that I just got sick of that pain well and I think moving to Thailand the whole move to Thailand was kind of getting away from after doing all the treatments, and EMDR was the last thing that I did in this country, out in Hertfordshire, which was quite mental. And then I went back to Thailand, and then I started going into this whole deep yoga and rabbit hole of hiking. And man, I remember Fritz, my brother, he's like, he's like my older brother, he's a, we call him the Six Pistol. You know, him and Hurley are my best mates in England. Hurley's my boy. You know, they're, unfortunately, they're Chelsea fans, which is a fucking problem for me. <laughs> um, and Curly Early and, and, and Fritz, you know, they're, and they've, they've always been around me since I've been in, in London. And, and uh, Fritz likes to go hiking, likes walking up fucking hills. What the fuck are you walking up a hill for? What the fucking walk up a hill. And I was like, I could never get my head around it. And of course, it's only when I went to Thailand, I, I started really enjoying walking up a hill. And because you, know, you know, you're in the middle of the fucking jungle and, and there's life and death. So going back to your point about the pain, you start unpacking it all. And, you, and you're realizing that that very thing which makes us 
is that what we're made up of? You know what I mean? The idea of womanizing, having all these women and all this other stuff, because you never understood your mother. So you're trying to, and also marrying a, I mean, I married a fucking stripper for fuck's sake. You know what I mean? Someone's going to be on the pole, never really commit to love, and always abandon you. You married your mother. You know what I mean? It's, it's, this, it's this whole idea of when you finally get through working that out, you're working out at the right time. What age did you get out of the care homes? Well, I got, I got out when I was eight, you know, I got out at 18. And, I, and that's what I'm saying. I went back to my mother's and I ran away at 17 and a half and went to my mother's place, found her. And it was a bit upside down, inside out. Your brother's taking your clothes. You, you, you know, his, his girlfriend's pregnant. And you were like, you're not supposed to get a girl pregnant until you're like 25. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's really green. And again, I'd witnessed the hood in this really mad perspective by being an observer. I think one of the most important things about where, let's, let's, let's not dwell on that fact. I've spent the last, the music has been, I guess this music and what I do is really the uncle under the stairs that no one wants to welcome to the party because he'll tell you the truth. We had the hype in the 90s and we created a world dominant fucking music. But is it, isn't it strange that this music that was so dominant in the 90s is still the music that, even programmers today, people that can program, can't program. They can't even imitate it because it's a bad imitation. Because this music is so powerful. You know, drum and bass music is that uncle under the stairs that no one wants to invite to the party because he's going to tell your kids the truth. And he's going to get fucking drunk and tell them the truth. And they're going to like it. And the parents, don't, don't, don't stay, how long are you going to stay for? Don't talk to the kids about your fucking music. And that's the fact. When you think about drum and bass music, because isn't it funny, isn't it weird that if you think about the impact of the 60s to the demographic in the 90s, you can be in the 90s, look at the 60s, and there's a 30 year difference. Or you can go to the Beatles and Sun Ra and all these bands that came out in the 60s, all these, but it's cream all off their heads on fucking acid, or it's the Stones. You can go, whoa, hippie fest, yeah, we all went to Woodstock, brilliant. And it's all kind of nostalgic. You can be in the 90s and you can be at 2020. And, we, and it's 30 years difference. The same disparity. But I can go out tonight, this weekend, and apart from the nostalgic early drum and bass music, I could still play drum and bass music tonight where 25 years go, what the fuck is this tune? Because it sounds the future. Because yeah, it's the only music that was made that was, not because of its speed, guys, that was just purely the, the speed it was at at the time, DJ culture. Yeah. But in the actual essence of the music, it's still the most forward-thinking music out there. Mm -hmm. And it's still the thing that people have to turn to, to kind of go, you know, I work out to D&B or I fucking, you know, I love D&B. And it's just got this thing where even on the overground, if there is even still that thing of an overground, underground, it's still the very, the most misunderstood music. It's a bit like uh, hieroglyphics from Pharaohs. It can't be understood. Only people that can read that stuff have to go to university to understand it. But we can do bubble letters if you want. We'll make it easy for you. We'll just create bubble mm. letters so it's easily readable, which is on one hand can be gentrification, but on the other hand can be a, a sense of us creating yeah. and giving you the music. So see, when you say it's misunderstood, is that part of you and your music? Because did you ever feel misunderstood? Yeah, it's totally, it's, we are what we eat, right? Mm -hmm. I think the fact that, isn't it weird that I gravitated when I was growing up to, to graffiti and drum and bass music? the two most misunderstood art forms of our generation. Was that therapy for you? Total therapy. I couldn't think of a better thing. You know, I went through that whole thing of what, we, what do we see as success? And how do you make, what do you measure fame by? And what is it? That stuff. Bullshit. It's bullshit, right? Because the white van man, great, Goldie, wicked. <laughs> he wouldn't know what I do on a day-to-day -day basis if it killed him. He wouldn't probably know, he means, you know, he's that guy, isn't he? He does that thing, you know? That stuff, isn't it? In a city life, wicked. Nine times out of 10 people on the street wouldn't have listened to Timeless. Yeah, the 21 minute version that Timeless, that inner city life comes from, extracted from, guaranteed. But the therapy in the music and the therapy in the art, I couldn't have wished for anything better. It's like, I remember, I remember Robbie, Robbie Williams. Don't like name dropping, but I'll give you Robbie. 
because Robbie's putting on a few pounds now he is living out somewhere <laughs> God bless him you should come and do this Robbie do you good um, I remember Robbie being off his, we were off our heads and he was seeing Jackie Hamilton Smith at the time sitting on the fucking doorstep going I fucking can't deal with his fame <laughs> oh, I always take that oh. and I'm sitting there going you're a fucking dick you're an absolute pleb and we went out and he just kept going you know he's fucking young he's off his fucking head and he went to my flat in Dorney Tower and he's going to borrow a shirt because he's going to keep going. And he borrows his fucking shirt. And it's a beautiful Stussy Rayon shirt. Never forget it. And we were, we're at Nelly Hooper's fucking doing what we do, having a laugh. And all of a sudden, there's a power cut or something happens. We go get his shirt because he's got, no, we've got no, the power's out. We walk to Dorney Tower around the corner. He gets the shirt. Because there's a power cut, he just fucks off to the West End. Does what Robbie does. Behave yourself, Robbie, you know, it's a long, long night. He ends up next morning on the front of the sun in a torn fucking shirt coming out of a from club with some bird hanging out of the back of him. Or we man out of the back of a bird. And I'm just thinking, fucking fame, man. That's the, the idea of what we think it is. When you get there, you realise he's just some little idiot behind a curtain. On a little fucking, you know, trying to turn all these fucking plates, right? Because fame, if that's fame, I don't want it. Because I don't want to be able to not walk down the street. That was my thing in the nineties of like I'm not giving a fuck. But I also like the idea of let's take, forget Goldie for a second. I could put my name down a list of all the people I've sat down with, pine, you know, all these things I've done, all all the cunty things I've done, all the bad things I've done. I think that guy's had a bit of an experience. That kid, kid A, if you like, has had a bit of an experience. But all throughout that mad therapy stuff, that stuff that happened, the bad and the good, it really made me who I am. And I wouldn't change a fucking thing. You know, I really yeah, wouldn't. Because that's the scary part, yeah. It's, it's experience that gives you the knowledge to then try and kick on and make those changes like fame. Part of me craved that growing up because I used to see people on TV, newspapers, and I thought, they look happy. I want that life. That will heal my pain. Then when you start progressing towards it, you realise, like the, inter the people I interview, you realise how fucked up they really are because <laughs> they were craving the same thing. And then once they get it, they realise, because everybody's got an opinion, social media, everybody's got an opinion and it hurts you. People, human beings are so sensitive, it stings. So people then get themselves in a box and then they think, fuck that, that's when they drink the drugs, the sex, to fulfil that yeah. loneliness, that emptiness. See when you came out the your children's homes and you were searching for your mum, did you ever ask her the question, like, why? Like the abandonment issues, how much I did asked, that yeah. mentally fuck I, you I up, Goldie? Yeah, I mean, for anyone that's out there, it's on YouTube, it's in HD, and Saturn's Return is not an easy watch. Mm -hmm. But you, again, the abuse of power in this life was having five cars on the driveway. Do you know what I mean? Like, why did I get, what, what is this, is this inherent black trait of, I always say to Mrs. it's quite funny. I remember live, being, without going off peace, I remember being in China and we're in Shanghai, and I'm like, she's like, I'm going to leave you today to do your own stuff. I'm like, yeah, all right, babe. And I go to the mall and I take two Os Oswald Boltang suits to get copied. And I'm looking through a swatch reference. Oh, look at all these mad materials. I can get my, I can get these suits made like cheap and they're going to look great. And I'm going through these things. I want that one and that one. And I come back like a week later and it's like, fuck me. She's, she, my wife comes with me. And when the guy comes out with my fucking suit, she's like, what were you thinking? I left you off for one week. And you've got like what looks like a fucking tablecloth NBA draft suit because I've got this, I'm looking at two inches by two inches. I'm not looking at how the material looks when it's blown up. And like, leave us to our own devices. When you get a record deal, the point being is we just go fucking mad. What about all the cars and the gold and the jewelry? Because I feel that I want to fill it and just go, I've made it. And then you think, you're a fucking idiot. Because it's monopoly money. Doesn't take your pain away. It doesn't take the pain away. And I'm there at five in the morning trying to find the last bit of gear in the fucking carpet and trying to call every fucking dealer who sensibly has turned his phone off. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? So I feel, I feel that that, I'm glad it's changed in a way because I think that half of the problem now is that with social media and all that stuff is that when you think about it, We'd already be writing in the streets if we never had social media. I think Instagram itself, by its own default, which is why people have got all happy about Higgsy and like, it's fucking great, Carrie, it's really funny. That's right, you're falling for the oldest trick. I do something really serious, you don't notice. 
I talk about some kid wanting to get a fucking heart transplant. No one gives a fuck. Put a moustache on me. Oh, I got ya. And I think the idea that if we didn't have Instagram and social media, we'd already be rioting in the streets for freedom. They've just gone, there's a great pacifier for them. Mark Zuckerberg, thank you. Stop the kids rioting. That's all it is. It's a fucking pacifier. Yeah. You know, and I've always said this. I'll get to 200,000 and I'll turn it off. See you later. I'll just go... Completed. And people will go, oh, fucking hell, you know, it's like boss levels, completed. You, I, you know, it's done its thing. Because it's proved a point that I don't really... What's more important is seeing Chance, my daughter, get set up in her life and seeing Coco, her character starts growing with herself and seeing our relationship grow and how the family grows. Um, and believe me, I think it's one of the things, because there's never really been a full stop in my life, because you said, you asked the question, and where I'm at now is by being in a place where I am, I, I checked myself this morning, and the first word I said was fuck. Damn it. You know, I didn't start off with a good mantra this morning because I stubbed my toe on the bed of fuck. And it's the first thing that come out of my mouth. I'm like, you've really ruined your mantra day because I realize that I still have to go off and do my meditation and try and think what's going to come out of my mouth to be the most positive thing today. And I'm really happy that I feel the happiest I've ever felt. I really do feel that People go, you're doing a lot of different things. I'll be doing that whether you're noticing it or not, because that's what I have to do. You said something earlier about, do you feel, I feel like I have to occupy this space because when I was alone, I can be dangerous alone. If I'm doing nothing, I can be fucking, I get bored, I can be dangerous. Which is, you know, you give me a bag of gear, I'm gonna fucking, you know what I mean? It's like, what do you want, what do you want good to come out of this? It's because nothing's good's gonna come out of this. You know, and I think having control and being able to be positive now, you know, obviously yoga's been a massive part. Painting and the gallery, you know, the Aurum Gallery in Thailand, me and my partner Gary, he's a fucking demon, he's, he's a great guy. And a guy that puts his money where his mouth is, Charlton boy. And uh, him and his son Frankie have, you know, they're, they're also, we're also investors in, in, this, in the screenplay. You know, I, I felt that everything that I've done has led to this moment, if that makes any sense. Of course. Cine Tempore oh. is now signed to Regency Film. Six episodes. I've got six hours to tell the greatest urban story, stories. I've got three stories they were intertwined in such a complex what i call bamboo tensile strength way i'm now at the age and the maturity where i'm gonna fucking nail this because i've had to reverse engineer it all you know timeless was always a screenplay in my head and i remember saying to pete to old mr tong years ago when i when he signed timeless please give me another half a million quid and i'll go and make a 21 minute film for timeless Goldie, polygram film, polygram music, two different things. Well, now all of those companies are realizing the bigger picture about uh, 360 deals. You know, it's all the same stuff, visual. You know, artists are, are not just about music, they're about visuals as well. But I'm really glad you never gave me the fucking money because I would never have completed something at boss level where I'm at now. And the great thing about Cine Tempore is just take a step back for a second. Is it a biopic? Kind of. Are there lots of characters that play you? Yes, there are a lot of characters that I've been and have been around that are exact. That is my, based on my brother. That character is based on my mom and my stepsister. That character is based on, you know, Patrick Harding, and that that's that's that that character is based on Patrick McKenzie, a pimp who drove a two point eight Capri. There's loads of characters that are from my hood that also represent a period of time from the 80s to the 90s that are really important to me. Yeah. And if there was ever going to be a process for healing young people, then I think this TV series 
would really be like, oh my God, that really helped me. Because, you know, you, I've had that example where people go, that music changed my life. Even Sunday, people go, this is the soundtrack to my life. So what if you can translate something that's just oral to so something that's really visual that really helps people? Because I've been doing this for years where you've been doing master's degrees within the music. And of course, I've dealt with the criticism by people that aren't even at the quality level to critique it. How can you be a music critic when you don't even understand that particular type of music? Yeah, never I, take advice from I, anybody. I've met people in fucking Sainsbury's, no disrespect to Sainsbury's, that are, that are putting stuff on the shelf going, oh my God, Goldie, how have you been? And I'm like, yeah, in the back of my mind, I'm like, yeah, fuck you, you were the one that gave me that really bad review, I remember that, how are you too? That's obviously not what I say to them. I just say hello and how's things and I hope things are working out for you well. But I'm still fucking here. And, and I think it's all sort of down to that, all, all that other thing as well, is that people that think they can just gentrify this music, which we've got, been getting away with it for years, that should know better because they come from this music. And of course, you know, certain people disagree with me, but can't say anything to me because they're not qualified enough. But you don't get to critique this music because you, you know, that's not fucking viable. You know, and, and, and I get it. And I, and I always feel to myself that, when you get paid by people to, to talk about this music and do this stuff, and you want to go and do some gentrified kiddie bollocks, then we'll cut the corner off that check, because that, that check doesn't, is not viable in my world. So when we have our opinions on it, shut the fuck up and get on with it, because yeah. you're more happy about you know, menstruating young ladies listening to your music and, and doing what you're doing. I get that, and no disrespect to young menstruating ladies or coming of age and young men mm -hmm. finding their way, but this music deserves we, don't, we shouldn't have to change it. I, I, didn't, I didn't hear a watered down version of Tamla Motown, you know, with Skiing in the Snow or any Northern Soul record, you know, or, or Tears of a Clown. I heard Tears of a Clown. I heard Marvin Gaye. I didn't hear a gentrified version of Marvin Gaye to get me into fucking soul music. I heard fucking Marvin Gaye. And that's the thing, the thing that I think that people feel that they, they, they get out of jail clauses. Well, they get out of, of jail clauses. And well, you know, it's just letting, it's getting people into the music, isn't it? Even though it's gentrified. Fuck off. Yeah. Fuck off. How did, you, how did Timeless come about? How did a kid who's been all the, through all this shit that you went through to them be creating 1996 when you won at the mobiles? How did that come about? Was that, how did you use the pain? How did you use that hurt and fucking fear and all that to then create something special to then change the game of drum and bass? Well, I think it, I think it changed the game of electronic music because at, at that time, you know, Diane had her own pain going on. You know, she was already in a soul band, 52nd Street. People forget that. Diane was in 52nd Street. I'd always been a, I'd always been a lover of English soul singers. I'd love soul. I mean, for me, SOS band are still the greatest soul band ever in America, the biggest influence. And I think that's why British people gravitated towards SOS band. And then you had like, you know, I still, I still think that Loose Ends were one of the greatest. You know, Hanging on a String is still one of my all-time favourite records. Um, you know, and, and Carl McIntosh, who I've never met. I mean, I think his son was in Steps or S Club 7 or some shit like that. You couldn't be further apart, right? Um, but Diane, we'd met, I was in London and, and just that whole, it all came about through Harry Bernstein. God, God bless... How are you seen in fucking France now on an island somewhere eating cheese and ham? Um, I used to sit in on the sessions at Utopia Studios and Mayfair Studios, watching Harry B moonlighting at you know two in the morning, you know being there in the early hours of the morning mixing down a track from Soul to Soul, while the other guys are you know are resting and just and even you know sitting there watching a master at work, and Timeless came about just by this idea of already being underground and creating this, this album. And I just feel like I wanted the music to grow up at that point. And I was being influenced by Reinforced Records, which is my camp, and Mark and Digo, who I love dearly. And the opportunity came up to break out of Reinforced and go with and make Synthetic, which was Angel EP, Terminator EP to begin with, and the Angel EP. And those two EPs are really like the apps, they're like the cement. And before there's a few late, you know, white late, you know, there's a few little releases on Reinforced, which are great, you know, Dark Rider and Chris Biscuit. But when I look back on those tunes and look back on that on that, that moment, I stand by those compositions 
it was very difficult to come off the back of, tight of Terminator to make Angel. That's probably the biggest jump. You're not going to make that canal jump. You know, when you were a kid, you jump the cut. And if you did that when you were young, we, you've got to jump the cut. Yeah. If you don't jump the cut, you're a wanker. You know what, <laughs> what I mean? You know what I mean? You've got to run. Mm. And I remember, I remember people not jumping the cut and like falling in. You've got to be able to, and it's narrow point. The cut, you know, the canal goes down, it gets narrow, and you've got to jump the cut. Um, and for me, that was the jump because it was very difficult to come off a really big tune that was on the underground to do something like Angel. And I, and, I, and I love that record because it's, you know, Angel was putting some real voice to it. I'd experimented with chemistry and all these other things. And obviously, Kemi was my muse at the time. God bless, God rest her soul. Um, and it was an, an amazing time because, like you said, at the Mobos, it was up against George Michael, George Michael, Eternal. Destiny, Eternal. Yeah. And you're thinking, this is an album. It's like, you know what I mean? It was, you know, of course, it's going to win. Best jungle act because there's no other, there's, there's hardly any, there's about three people in the same thing. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? It's like, I hate that when they just yeah. go, let's get a token award for these people that are like, you know, but it, was, it won best album. And how was that feeling for you? Um, did that spiral you or did it make you proud or did that, how did it affect it made you? Me very, it made me very proud, but I think you also got to understand that on that album, there were already seven tracks that were already been played on the underground seven years prior. You know, it's, it's the amalgamation of the work. But I, th but I also think it was the price to pay because everyone wanted Timeless 2 and you're never going to get it. They got Mother. I still think to this day, Saturn's Return, of course, it's never going to get its kudos until I'm long gone. And so, you, you know, they celebrated it in France last year. Go on, Frenchies. The art, you know. Um, I feel that Mother is a black opera. It could be the most revered black opera. If some company came along and went, I think he's right, I think he's got a point here. This is black opera at its finest. Because they all pay the money to do all these other things, but that there is a black opera. Mm -hmm. It shows a kid's journey and he's lamenting for his mother. You see, the story of mother is that as an artist, as a pure Puritan, not giving a fuck about what you've got to say about it because you've got your own shit to deal with, when I was on that, when my mother died and she was on the fucking slab, I, it was a week to be able to go to America. And my brother, my brother who I fucking hate is because one of my brothers, Melvin, can't fucking abide him. I have a certain empathy for him, but can't abide the guy. But I'm yogied out. I give you peace, my brother. But I'm not going to sit down and eat a meal with you. You know, when he died, we should all get together now. No, that woman in there is not your mother. She's a shell. That's a ghost in a shell, young man. No, but you know what I mean? We should get together. I'm like, uh, it's a shell. And I'm going to America. And my mother, in the documentary about her and about what this very composition is about, was that she said, play it at my funeral. Mom, it's an hour long. Everyone's going to fuck off and leave. And it's going to be a really boring funeral. I'll play it, I'll play it at your, you know, I'll come and see you. And we hugged it out at the end of the documentary and we're in bits and I'm crying and she's crying. And I go to the Chapel of Rest. You know, I turn up, I go there and I'm going to go into this place and I go in there and the guys, I see my brother come out and I wave to him at a distance. All right, you've had your piece of right? right, I'll go in now. And the guy's there and he's like, oh Goldie, I knew you were going to come. I'm really sorry for your loss. Do you want a cup of tea? Oh, fucking yes. Better be a Yorkshire tea bag. Yes, cool, great. Two and a half sugars, just like my mum would make it. And he says, she's the door number five. And I'm walking down the hallway and I can just feel my screenplay all unraveling because part of it was inspired by these moments. And I just slide the doors open and there she is. Box open, little Scottish woman. And it's just like a fucking white monkey with skin stretched over its face. And I remember walking, just, just this moment of being in this vacuum and walking towards her dead body and leaning over and just going. And it was just the coldest, like, it's, it, anyone that's kissed a dead body of one's mother or father or sibling, it's like the coldest fucking marble. It's nothing like it. It's just too much. And then that, that kind of made me realize that, you know, she's, She's not there. 
and from a really Freudian perspective, which is, I guess, Hoffmanites would understand this. One thing that human beings never do. I'll challenge you, Mr. James English. When was the last time you felt this bad boy? Button connection. When was the last time you felt this bad boy? Mm -hmm. When was the last time you really felt your belly button, folks? Because all of the strands that are tied to the ship deck pull out the deck and they just start lashing around. I should have done this. I should have done this. My mother. There. And the anger comes out. All of the emotions tied to your mother, and they all go. Shh, shh, shh. And you've just got to hold them in here. They're going to lash around, but have an understanding that connection to one's mother is the most important. Umbilical cord. Did you blame your mum for a lot of things, Goldie? I blame my mother for everything, and I think that in 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 total unfairness. So how do you heal from that then? Okay. So the point is that I never finished off, which I never do. Making Saturn's Return, even though it was a good documentary, I was still berating my mother. I had all the money in the world. I just wanted to get my mother and father in a room and tell them how badly they've done and performed as parents. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and I felt that was really fucked up because you dickhead. You're a fucking knob for doing that, really. Because it, in the end, when the penny finally dropped, it's like, fucking... Your mum just fell in love with a black guy. She was kicked out of a family. She was a fucking family of alcoholics. Her father beating her all the fucking time. And she's seen a nigger. That's what, that's what he said. You've seen a fucking nigger, get the fuck out. And my dad was like, oh, you me and your mother get an argument and we go out and play a son, you know, in a workout. And well, you promised to the earth, dad. Like I probably promised the earth off my tits as a fucking young bird when I was growing up. Do you know what I mean? Like, we're going to get married. No, you can actually, we're going to look after you forever. No, we're not. You're married a stripper. I'm going to get divorced. It's going to cost me 250 grand. Do you know what I mean? So where, where else would it have gone? The idea that I, I held her account, it was your fault. It wasn't. It was my, 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 me wanting to understand it, even in my adult life, showed what a dickhead I was because I just thought you could put your mom and dad in a room and just go, tell me why you went wrong. Where did it... Me asking the question is that moment. There's one moment in that documentary where I just say to this... I go on the fly when we were filming to Mr. and Mrs. Newell and I, I ask the question in the room. I, I bring the buzzer. I'm like, because I found out where she lived and I'm bringing every buzzer. And go, oh, is that Clifford? I wonder when you are we're going to come. Literally just like that. And the woman comes down the stairs, lets us in, I'm walking up the stairs, and she says, come up here, we're up here. And we go up with a film crew. And I'm like, do you mind, I've got a film crew with me. I don't mind, do you want a cup of tea? I knew I'd see you. And I go in there, and I sit in the front room, and she pulls out a fucking biscuit tin. This isn't scripted. She pulls out a fucking biscuit tin. And when she comes up with the biscuit tin, and I went, I just held my throat, I went, where did it all go wrong? with Rita, and I'm holding my throat. I don't know what made me do it. She went, yeah, you drove Rita mad. She had an operation, and I went, oh, and as she said it, she had an operation on her throat, because she kept driving her mad. Well, this is the bird that was fucking nonsing me. It was an adopted fucking sister, it was older than me, and I had no control. So uh, she said to me, you would, you know, and it's this moment that stays with me, that was like, fuck you now. She said, you don't remember, whenever you were left alone in a room with a woman, you'd scream at the top of your voice. I'm like, what? She said, yeah, whenever you were left alone with a woman, you'd freak out. Oh, that makes sense. I'm just fucking, this bird's forcing me down on her and she's a fucking big woman. And I'm like, if you ever fucking, and it all started coming back to me. If you start, if you tell anyone, you're going back to the home. And it becomes this whole kind of abuse where you think, that's where I fucking went wrong with women. You know what I mean? It's where the whole idea of women and not being good enough and all that stuff was like, fucking, I was getting non out by this older fucking foster person who was adopted, who had me banged to rights because she's like, you say anything to anyone, you're going back. And in the end, I went back because I fucking broke her. I just keep whispering to her when she's at dinner. Like a little weed growing through concrete. You know, when you're a young kid, and you, 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 you're in the land of giants, right? How the fuck can you survive? 
I didn't have a fucking, I didn't have a David and Goliath sling. I just had my art. I, that's all I had. I could, all I had was I could draw. And I'd use this fucking escape, just drawing, you know what I mean? Just drawing and music. I fucking love music. So see when your mum passed, how did you deal with that? Did you deal with it straight away? Was it like a closure or was there a lot of grief afterwards, like was, months, yeah, years? Yeah, there was a lot of grief. I mean, I'd, I'd, there was a lot of grief because exactly. See where I just finished that point? I've just gone from that tangent all the way around to the abuse because I felt so linked. That be, because, so linked. Huh? It's all linked. It's all linked because I felt that I'm blaming you for all of that stuff. And as much as mother, uh, my mum always said to me, I tried to get you away from me so you wouldn't have to experience what I'd experienced. Yeah. Does she know how deep it went with you though? Mm, no. I, I couldn't tell her about the, the abuse. Even when she, before she was dying, I, I, I couldn't tell her what had, was been happening because she would have broke her heart. It would have killed her. But in a lot of respects, I can understand why my brother was so angry. Did he go through the same stuff as you? Because he went though? through, but he saw the violence of my mother. My brother's always been violent. You know, I, I, you know, I could go into a pub with my brother, and if someone's seen his ex bird, she can't be an ex bird. You know, we go, and I'd go, oh please, Mel, not tonight. And he'd go, no, no, I'm going to buy him a pint. And he'd go, on, and I'd see him walk around the bar, and he'd go, I'm going to buy you a pint. And I'm like, fucking, he'd buy the guy a pint, and the guy put his arm around him, and Melvin would get the pint. He just glass him. It's so like, for fuck, you know, and the guy, I've seen the guy like, God, I've gone about seven years, fucking, he was in Wolverhampton doing a show and he just turned up. Do you know what I mean? My fucking brother glassed him in the face. Horrible cunt. You know, the whole family was just fucking mad. And, you know, you know my little brother Stewie, you know, I love Stewie because he's Stewie's mother. Stewie's always around mom's thigh. At the back of mom's leg, that's where you'll find him. Come on, Stewie, fucking coming out. You know, we'd, he'd always see all the shit in it, but I love Stewie. I mean, because Stewie's, I've always played a, a role of his father in a way as well. Um, but the, going back to the idea of the, the pain with mother, I mean, I think, I think why it's important without rambling on too much, for anyone that's gone through this, making sine tempore, because that's what it's called, even in its very title, People are going to go, fuck's that, man? Sine, S-I-N-E, tempore. Tem T-E-M-P-O-R-E, apostrophe. I don't even know what apostrophe ting mean, but yeah, some little flick on the top, some little French ting. No, it's like it's Latin. Without time. Because we're dealing with this, this box. You know, temporal lobby's function is the main device. I mean, I was searching for it all my life. I kind of think I suffer from it. It's the idea of, the inability to process episodic memory. That's it. All these events happened to me, but when did they happen? They're all shuffled. My timeline is completely fucked. But I remember these moments because they're linked to music. They're linked to the smell. You know what I mean? Like, like, and I think that's why graffiti, I gravitated towards it because when I ended up in New York with graffiti, I met these people that, want, that didn't care. What you, I did. You were accepted. I was accepted by them, man. And they felt like I was connected to them where I was like, even in England, I, 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 was, I was getting, I was, I'd, wear, I'd wear a donkey jacket at a youth club and they'd put GB, G, GBH on and punk at the time. And I was the kid that was going to get a kick in. Because it was all about, let's just turn, turn on the black kid. I like black people now, man. We should let him in the gang. Yeah, you know I mean, you know, I like I like baseball caps and trainers. You know what I mean? Every now and then, you know, it's this the the inception without. Let's not go into that fucking department now, but the idea of of how it's you know, if anyone's seen Death of England, I highly recommend it. A beautiful play by a mentor of mine, Clint Dyer, who's now working at the Royal Court. You know about how how, how it's infused racism is infused in this country. You know, imagine the idea of these French players going back to France because they never made it to the final and they didn't win it, getting fucking whipped and all of a sudden we're just blaming loads of fucking young black players. Is that the thing, is it? No, they weren't good enough. You know, but I'll celebrate the monkeys if they get us to the final. But if they don't win, off with their heads. <laughs> it's just typical. Oh, that's madness. It's typical, you know, debauchery, entitlements. Just blame it on alcohol, mate. And all these fucking fans. You imagine if us went out to fucking Wembley and I put a flare in my mate's arse. And sniff loads of fucking gack. If I was black, 
Oh, they'd fucking make a party of that, wouldn't they? That's wouldn't madness. they? That's and, and that's what terrible. I'm saying, but nothing happens. And I think, you know, it's down to this whole idea that, you know, England is made up of people like us. Don't forget that. You know, and, 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 and you know, I, I, I like baseball cats and fucking trainers every now and then. Get the fuck out. It's like this idea of what, we're all part of something. And, and I think that I've had to go away to Thailand to, to go and work out, you know, to be no one, not to be recognised in the street. Is that to recharge? Yeah, I like that. I, I'm just not, you know, in my own, my own village. I live in a Muslim village in the middle of fucking nowhere. Well, you're going to Thailand. Are you running away or running towards something? I'm running towards something. I'm running towards a different kind of light. I love the... Running away was going to America, was doing all these other things that made me into this other person. But the idea of being in a place... It was really weird being back last week, the first gig this weekend, right? Which is going to be for you guys, or maybe a couple of weeks ago. In Bristol, two gigs, you know, where you go into a gig where people are sitting down listening to drum and bass. I'm like, that's fucking S&M come down with me shit. <laughs> it's not the S&M of drum and bass, right? It's like, what the fuck? You know, because you put, you've got a week a week earlier, you've got football fans all standing up screaming and putting flares in each other's arses. Mm -hmm. That's weird. How we balance this thing out. And I find it really frustrating because I'm thinking, yeah, okay, I'm getting paid to do this. But just being around humans. And I said to the missus, I've got to fucking, I've just got to come back and scrub out. Like I felt like people's energy is attaching to me. So I've just got to de, you know, like with me and you, I said to you, like, mate, I need a day where I can just chill. chill and just recalibrate. But going to Thailand to do, I wouldn't have been able to write the screenplay, being in England, but just being here and every fucker and his dog stopping you in the street, or, you know, you get this great one. This is the classic, man. This is fucking classic. Uh, Goldie, I'm really sorry to disturb you while you're here with, sorry, but your wife. Uh, and you hi. Um, listen. I used to know you back in the day, and, I, and I'm like, I'm like fucking Dave Chappelle, chicken, monkey, people, what? What the fuck are you saying to me? And why are you coming to me when you know, I'm sorry to say, it's that same old fucking scenario that people say to you, they come up to you and they go, selfie, yeah? I'm like, what's the, what's the magic fucking word? Oh, please, oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. You can say sorry four fucking times, but you can't say, hey man, please can I get a picture? Fuck off. Don't ask me. Again, unfollow me. <laughs> and, and you get also, you get this thing with, you know, we're going back to this point about being here where people come and go, man, you need to put this person on your, on your bill and this person needs to be DJing and this person needs to be, whoa, 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 do me a favour. I don't care if you're in a fucking wheelchair in Illinois. Yeah, I don't care if you're standing in fucking Texas telling me about, nah, man, you shouldn't be working with like Louis Vuitton and like, you know, like you know, it's appropriation. And you're talking about a black guy who was working with Jay-Z when he's 17. And who are you? You're someone from Texas? Get the fuck off my page. You know, the idea of how people believe and what they think about what the workings are, the inner workings. I'm like, number one, if you want a club and you want a career, go and do it your fucking self. Don't come on my platform. I've had people that I love come on my platform with long-winded fucking rabble. If you've got a platform, put it on yours. Don't use my platform to come and fucking just, you know, shout from the houses about your shit. People are always looking for shortcuts, though. Fuck off. Yeah. How was that? Your girl, was it the girlfriend at the time, Chemistry? Kemi, yeah, how, Kemi's... How did that, was, how, when that Kemi tragic was accident... Tragic. Kemi was tragic. I mean, it's one of those things that, you know, they went out to do a gig that they shouldn't have done. Somebody dropped out. Of course, Kemi and Storm... Well, up for any gig. Didn't matter. We got this gig. Somebody dropped out. Let's go. <laughs> you know what I mean? Typical. Typical. And I bet even Storm was like, "Let's go." And I'm like, "Oh." You know, and I think I think Storm has gone through a lot of her own fucking therapy. You know, I think she's gone through a lot of trauma. I don't think. I think that witnessing her die in that car, and the ambulance isn't coming. I think that's. I think the repercussions of that, have already proven you know, with yeah. what she's gone through. I can't speak for her. And, uh, you know, Kemi's death. And I, I, I only take comfort in the fact that me and Kemi were so close. Even when we parted, we were very amicable. I said, this fame shit's gonna get in the way and I'm gonna be hanging out at the back of birds. I know what's gonna happen. I think we should just be mates. And we laugh about it. 
but she always said, Kemi always said, there's something darker here trying to hold me down a lot. There's something, she'd always say that, there's something in this fucking room. And this isn't one you've off your tits on a weekend. Kemi's one of the most sensible, I'm one of the most skeptic people I've ever met. She'd say something, some, sometimes she couldn't move. She'd be in a room and she'd be held down. And, she, and it was always something that was weird in our lives. I'm like, happened again? She went, yeah, just came from here today. Like something, something stopped me. I'm like, what the f and she always said, you know what? I'm fucking never gonna get old. She swore by that. She was like, oh, fuck that. Wrinkly face and all these fucking bags. Take me now. She'd always say that. Do you think she put that into existence? I don't know. I think she manifested it. I really do. Yeah. I really do. Did that affect you, Goldie? Um, it did affect me because this, this, the Dark Force shit, which was weird. I did my, you know, I was, did my first trips with Kemi. I did my whole thing. I did my whole thing with Kemi. I did my whole thing with learning to want to make music for her. You know, Kemi, she was a very powerful song. The versions of it are very powerful. Um, there's a thing called Chemistry Alpha, which I just found, you know, I found it last year, which is fucking weird. And it's the original version of Chemistry, of which I made to then go away and write the song for it. So it becomes a lot more soft around the edges once you write the song for it, but it's raw as fuck, yeah. playing it on Friday. When were you at your height if you are drinking drugs? Height of drinking drugs was gotta be 90, 2000, 90, yeah, 2000 was the down, like, So after imploding. all the success, the album Imploding, yeah, like really. I, I'd have it on speed dial. I'd have it on speed dial until it became like a controlled situation for me. I'd have it in, it would be the worst for me. But I wasn't a bleacher. I wasn't like a guy that could get up and keep going for three days, like Brandon Block. It wasn't ever my thing. You know what I mean? And I fucking hated Ibiza, you know, because it was just like, I just couldn't, I couldn't deal with it. It was only by going back to the island, by being sober and being at the island where yeah, appreciate I could deal it more. with it. You know what I mean? Yeah. And I think it's even things like Saki, like Dasai 23, no sulfates, understanding the signs of alcohol. You know, drinking Saki was a whole different thing than drinking vodka mm -hmm. for me. Um, but I think with chemistry's death, it was, it, although it was tragic, there's always a thing where I'm, if I'm making something, I'm like, what would Kemi think? You know, and even this new project, me and Jane, I mean, the only partner I've ever accepted, I mean, I've had engineers, but James, James has got to be, you know, James Davison has got to be by far probably the greatest engineer I've ever worked with because he's a partner. I never met anyone a partner. I, you know, even management would go, even, even before management was separating it, I'm like, right, this is my fucking ship. This is what we're gonna make. Here's a drawing of what we're gonna make. Here are the vocal guides of what we're gonna sing. I'll deal with the singer and this is what we're gonna, and you're gonna start here, 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 and I'll draw it all out. I'm, I'm so, because of having control, because my life was controlled by others, the idea of me making music, it's, it's on my terms now, do you understand? In a very Freudian way, me making music to the ability and the way that I do it is because of control. I'm not gonna fucking let you think that you're writing this music. But James is the only guy with subjective, I mean, everyone missed subjective one because we, we never had our names attached to it. But subjective two, ironically, is going out with Pete Tong, who signed Timeless 20 fucking six years ago. Legend. You know what I mean? And Pete, people forget that Pete was the greatest a and man at London Records, who signed this great music. And he was also the only guy that sat in an office and listened for 21 minutes without pressing stop. I get people like awkwardly, you know, on Friday, you're going itchy for that. You can see they're itchy for the drug dealer. <laughs> All you gotta do is ask me, I'll sell it to you. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? Because they're sitting there going, and then you get the roller decks. Mobile, this is before mobile phones, right? They get the roller decks and they start turning it and then they sit back in the chair and they start leaning back. And then, you know, it's seven minutes in. This is, this is uncharted territory because you're talking about a 21 minute piece of music. And by eight minutes, they're fucking dying. It's Friday night. They just want to get their fucking dealer and they want to get the fuck out. And then they lean over and it's like playing, um, you know, like a gunfight. You're waiting for him to just twitch. And he twitches and he flinches like, bam, that's it, he's over. He switches it off and goes, yeah, we'll be in touch. And I knew that the album was never gonna get signed to them. And as soon as I walked into Pete Tong's office, I walked in the office, my dogs walked in massive, and anyway, everyone knows me for the night, it's fucking massive, it was a legend. 
He was a fucking legend, that dog. It was like a band dog. He was half pit, half rock wild. It was fucking insane, this dog. And he, he'd go everywhere and he walked in and he'd jump on the seat and he'd just stand on the seat up like that. He sits up and Pete's looking at the dog and I just, I remember throwing the cassette on the, on the table going, you're going to sign that. Sugar man shit. You don't do that in this day and age. Do you know what I mean? I just threw the tape on. And he, I remember Pete saying, that, are you more scared of the dog or more scared of me? And he puts the cassette in and, and he sat down and he listened to it 21 minutes. There, me and the dog. Didn't move, 21 minutes. And as soon as it finished, he went, where do I sign? And part of it was in Pete's own language was that he did, he'd already missed out on, um, he'd already missed out on left field and he'd already missed out on Jazzy. He wasn't messing out on that. And, he, and it was the third time. Mm-hmm. And I think what's ironic about going back to the point of James is that I've got a really, I've got the crew around me now that I never had. Because as much as what I call, I've been catching sand for years. <sighs> fuck it, it's getting quick out. Oh, fuck, you still got to get some. I've always got sand in the hand. The difference was that the holes that I've been crucified with through every other cunt, I've got holes in my fucking hands. And there's a big pile of sand on the floor. It seems like a big waste. And now I've kind of healed those holes. Does that make sense? Yeah. So I feel that. James, Gary, my partner in crime, Leon's managing the gallery. I've got James, I've got Johnny Miller, who's running the label. You know, I've, got, I've not got a dickhead of a fucking label manager in fucking Asia anymore. I've got all of these great fucking things. I've got, you know, these are the, th- these reminders of like, there are still some dickheads around. You give people opportunities and they burn them. And you think, you can't burn opportunities like that, Sunshine. It's the fucking year 2020. Do you know what I mean? And yeah. you've got, this, I mean this is global international shit. And James has been the only guy. I mean, we've done. He's been coming to Thailand for the last six, seven years now. Six years. Every comes seasonally, comes to Thailand. And the first major thing was Journeyman, as an album. And Journeyman is a master's degree in drum and bass music. End of. Because his root math. Some people still don't understand that album because you're going to listen to it in twenty years ago. Yeah, it sounds normal now. It's root math. And I've just got to this point in my life, like I said, the golden age, where I'm like, let's just do some nice bubble letters for them. People come at me, yeah, you're a cunt. Yes, I am. Which kind of cunt is that to you? (laughs) So the idea of Journeyman was being that, and I think subjective, we've just done a really beautiful album. And you've got like, you know, Natalie Williams is a given, you know, because I've mentored Natalie for a long time. Natalie Duncan, should I say, Natalie Duncan, Natalie Williams, Cleveland Watkiss, Frida, you know, uh, Lady Blackbird, yeah, La Medusa, you know, which is one of my artists, Faze in Belgium, his, his wife, you know, uh, in her own right as a great vocal coach and a great artist. So me and James have had such fun, because James gone, listen to this, check these beats out. And I'm like, fucking hell, James, what, how do you, what do you, what do you where did you get this? When Mara just fucking put it together while we just while you were just sitting there, just fucking, you know, give me an hour, I'll come back in a minute. It's just a machine. But the way that James thinks now is probably is probably the only guy that I've mentored in the modern age. That gets that? That really gets it. Yeah. And I, I think through the music, going back to one of the most valid points about this, I've become the Victor Meldrew of breakbeat culture. I do not want to listen to your fucking demos. Why? Because nine times out of ten, I'll let you unless I, I, I let I let the young guns, my label manager, and I let you know. If you come to me and say this fucking tune is gonna fuck you up, I prefer that. When you send me a link to SoundCloud, I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, just give me a fucking block of ice and a fucking noose mm-hmm. and a fucking four bar heater. <laughs> I'd rather you go do what we did. Fucking put it on a USB, send it to me. Meet me in the street. Know where, know where I'm going to hang out. And just go, check this out, mate. There you go. Mm-hmm. And I get it's the new way, but it's like when you just read the email, you kind of know that. And then you know, you know what it is? I've tested this out. And I've sat there for hours listening to these demos. And I'm just going, I'm never going to get this fucking time back. Yeah, people are lazy, though. Everybody's soft and, and too scared to take risk. How did the acting career start off? How did you end up in a James Bond film? One of the best British gangster films of all time as well. Snatch. Snatch. How did that come about? Um, well, I've been an actor for 55 years now. 
acting the whole fucking sexual <laughs> on bombs. He was just guy, you know, guy and guy and those boys I'd met briefly, and I'd, and I'd, and obviously Stevie, um, who I fucking love to death, and Stafe, is back here now in the country. And Stevie actually is the main lead in, in the TV series. He's one of the main leads. Um, and since then, it was. I think it, I don't know. It just it just in a weird way. I think James Bond happened because I was the popular guy at the time. You know, you look at people like I look at billboards with like young black grime artists. I'm thinking I remember that when you were in New York doing Dig Care and Wild doing Tommy Hilfiger. You know, because you're popular, they they're gonna call you up and they're gonna get. It's just it's about how much money you're gonna get at the time. You know what I mean? Just do it. And I've seen that repeat itself, you know, like with young eyes. And I'm thinking, yeah, good on you. Do you know what I mean? Go and get that, whether it's Bogota or Bogota or fucking Diesel or, you know, whatever it might be. And, you, you know, you've seen people, you know, with Nike and doing well. And I just think it just kind of, it, was, it kind of happened. But I never really pursued it. I had a really shitty acting agent called Lucy. who was a fucking idiot. Like a real, you know, just, again, it was just like power trip. Do you know what I mean? And like, you know, we're going to, you know, EastEnders was good. But you're like, I see it. And you're only in there, you're only in there for like fucking 13 weeks. And people think you're in there for the rest of your life. But I stole James Bond fucking hell. One of the biggest franchises ever. Does it make I'm, you feel proud, Goldie, like everything you've accomplished and achieved so uh, far in life? Nothing's going to make me rest until Cine Tempore. On the day of principal photography, when we begin, I know you go, action. I've got nothing else in my rear view mirror right now. Just that's like I'm serious. looking in this mirror and I'm looking left and right. And believe me, technology is great. You can zoom in, zoom out, right? And I never had that shit before. I had to keep looking on my shoulder. Now I've got three fucking avenues. I'm looking where I am. I've got the yoga in this mirror. I've got that one in there. You know, the idea of this screenplay, A, going to the theatre, going to theatre, finding young black theatre actors, going to workshop these actors, looking for young directors that are fucking shit art, young, black, white, it doesn't matter what they are, as long as they can fucking do it, and I can see what they've done, and I can take that risk by like, you know when an artist comes to me and he goes, gee, check this demo out, and I hear it, and I'm, I'm, I'm 16 bars in, and I'm like, oh wow, where's he going with this tune? And I know, we, and even though I can read where he's going, he's making the right moves, and he should change, yes, now. And he's about to, yeah. You know, we can read this shit. It's when I hear these fucking things that aren't good enough, going to the point. People get really offended. Like, you're saying about greatest achievement. The greatest achievement will be sine tempore. And I've said this before. You can put every canvas on a bonfire. You can put every composition, light it up, light it. I lose it all. Just to do this. Because all of that is this. You know, it's like this is an ounce and a bit. It's like an ounce and a half. Hand carved in wax. And it's my wedding ring. My wedding ring. And it looks nice and shiny. Beautiful. But it's not the fucking ring that means anything. It's the crucible of which it came from means everything. When I fucking melted that gold in the crucible to, to fucking heat it up, to see the silver dot across the surface like chaos, and you hit that and it goes... Whoa, and it goes into the mould. That is the art. So the last 55 years, you'll be basically burning That's the gold. That's 55 years. Of burning burning the gold, understanding that you've got to use settling, not mm -hmm. just oxygen. Yeah, where, the, how did, where does a gold teeth come from? When did well, that happen? Well, that's in Miami. I mean, gold, I, I, learned, I learned from a guy called Orlando Pleen, who's the greatest... Forget everyone else was making gold teeth in Atlanta for a second. We're talking Eddie from Suriname with all of his brothers, and they all came to New York. And Eddie went to the Coliseum and his brother went to Jacksonville and one went to Atlanta and Orlando went to Miami. The five brothers, all making gold. And Eddie came up with this fucking idea. And I mean, you look at things like Just Ice Cover. These early, early, early Jay-Z when he was 17 with a gold tooth. Eddie, before all these trendy fucks came out, he's the original gold teeth guy in the United States of America. He's the first guy, the first, hands down, to go from Suriname Dutch, New York, and all the family spread out. That's why Gold Teeth are in Atlanta, because his brother went down to fucking Jackson and went down to Atlanta. That's how it happened. The first wave, if you like. I know I used to go, when I was in Miami, my dad's in, in Carroll City, Jamaican family, a minister. 
getting over his sins, running rampant in England. And I just used to go to the flea market. I used to be in Miami Beach in the day, trendy, looking at Art Deco, and all these gay guys that want to fucking pay you to do paintings and fucking all these rich, wealthy fucking Hispanics that were on the beach. Crazy. And then on the underground, I'd be in like the flea markets working. And I just thought this was my place. I always gravitated to the hood. And I was in the flea markets, 179th Street, USA flea market number one, which was only bulldozed two months ago. And I learned a trade by, I was doing Airbus t-shirts at the time. And I, I get guys coming in, dealers. Yo, and they give me a Polaroid. You got to bring a photograph. Yo, it's a picture of this guy with a 190. I want a picture of me, man, holding an Uzi and, uh, and with like 100 grand on the hood. And he just goes, I want, this is the Uzi. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, just take a picture of the Uzi just so you can get the detail of the Uzi right. And I'm just airbrushing t-shirts. Or oh, no, it was Taniqua's birthday and I've got to do Taniqua's face. You know, and you just do a representation of it. And he was always late, Orlando. He was always doing some mad shit. And he'd just come in the booth and I'd have to take prints for people. You know, you take the alginate. You mix the alginate. You sit, sit them down. You've got your gloves on. You oh, put the alginate in. You take the print. You stay still for a couple of minutes. You take it out. You put the fucking, so make the plaster inside it. You knock all the air out of it. You put the name, bell, you take the deposit. You just take about 80 bucks, 80 bucks, 100 bucks deposit. And then they come back in two weeks for their goals. And they come in, you've, you know, you've sanded out the inside of it, you put it on, is it fitting right? Not quite clipping in there yet, you take it out again, look at any obstacles, put it back on the, on the mold you've got to just make sure it's fitting right. I mean, this happened week in, week out for years. Is it sore? Huh? Is it sore? Getting teeth done. No. What's that? Is it sore getting no, teeth done? No, 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 no. You just go there, go over, go over, you go over your teeth. And we, we just do this, we just do this for years. And now, it's to the point where he had to become a real dentist because he was totally against the law. I mean, it was like, fuck. <laughs> I mean, this fucking yeah. cockroach is running around yeah. when I'm, I'm dumping the water in the bucket. And yeah. it's like, do you know what I mean? It's like, it was, it's a nightmare. It would have been a legit, and he had to go and do the real courses and all this other stuff. Um, but we did that. And it's a, it's a real part of my life. You know, I mean, given the equipment, I can wake up in the morning and make a beautiful gold ring. It's an art form to itself. It's the craft, if you like. Another craft of like, well, it's a craft graffiti of, kind of stuff. Well, like, it's not, I guess it's also about changing form for imagination, me. Imagination, no? creativity. Yeah, there's a, great, there's a great book. It's called All Things Remembered. And that's the second book. The first book was about how many birds you've banged and what their names are. As you do. But the second book was really taking a step back the new, this new person, this Clifford that I know in Miami. And I'd, you know, the, the, that guy that was in Miami was a totally different person. You know, I was running drugs up and south, up, up and down the country. It was just mad shit was going on. Knowing that whole madness was fucking crazy, deranged. Stuff that was happening that was like fucking guns and all these, you know, one of the main yardies was, who was always coming for goals, was one of our diamond setters. Then why come on you man? Go fuck them, I miss you. I'm gonna kill them both, block up wide, and And this guy was off his head all the fucking time. Bad man. And I remember being on the phone on, on the bottom of 121st Terrace, hearing shots down the road, thinking, rah, rah, I was on the phone with my bird in England. And the next thing you know, I put the phone down, and then Orlando turns up, and he's like, yo, fucking Jackson's been ironed out. And we go down the block, and it's like, his fucking head's, he's been fucking just been shot. His fucking head's on the interior. All the interior of his car is just red. The hardest guy I know just got ironed out. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Like, yeah. so, so all of that stuff, going back to the point, I was in Thailand just writing this book, but I'd be lying on the, a boat, like a boat that I'd made in the, in the, in the, in the base of the house. Made it talking like I'm talking to a fucking shrink because I'm just recording, talking to myself. And I'm creating the chapters. And, and there's a great writer, um, Ben, who, we, who, who I'd given, the, he did both of John McEnroe's books. Ben Thompson is a fucking great writer because he took, he took all this information and he's gone, this is a really good way of doing it. We've got all these mad chapters. And because you don't have a full stop in your life, 
and you're everywhere. Let's do it so that it punches up and down. And it doesn't go, and it's like it's crazy, the, the way that the book reads. So I find, what, what do I want to finish off? How do I want to, what is my end game here? The beautiful thing is that regardless of whether I want to or not, I have no control over the power of the art. And one of the only mantras I've got because I've always saw, you know when you see quotes on t-shirts of people, and it's mine, and I feel proud of it. A truthful idea lasts in the honesty of time. That's mine. That's mine. That's it. That's on my fucking gravestone. A truthful idea lasts in the honesty of time. Because everything that I've done with all of this stuff, leading up to this stuff, is about the hard work you put into this. You know, I can imagine all these people go like, no oh, man, like when you listen to these demos and when you do this and it's like, I get it. I get all of that stuff. But you've got to come through the pecking order and you've got to know how, how you've got to know that the record's good enough. Because I knew that when I cut this on the dub plate and I'm paying 50 quid, I had no fucking food on a Friday night. I would literally do without money. I would spend my last 50 quid cutting Dark Rider knowing I'm gonna go a little bit hungry tonight. But you know what, I can, I can nick well. As six fish fingers, I'm all right. I've done it before. I'm all right, I can steal food. You know what I mean? A big man stealing food, you know? <laughs> but you're not gonna notice, because he wouldn't expect it. So I've done all that stuff. You know, Dorney Tower, going to fucking, the, all the trendy shops. I ain't got a fucking clue. I mean, I mean, if you can steal in the hood, you can steal anywhere. So I've gone through all of that stuff where you think, this is where I want to be. I, I, I think that the, everything that I've ever done, even though it goes off on tangents, leads to the fact that I want to make something that people can really enjoy and laugh at. And it's not just going to be depressing, it's going to be a really beautiful screenplay that in fact will help people dealing with what all of this trauma is about now. Because I see it, and I think the effects of what COVID's done to people. It's also made a lot of artists go inside themselves. You know, a real dear friend of mine, he's become very close in this short space of time, is Virgil. Abelard. I mean, this guy is just... I thought I worked fucking hard. This motherfucker is like... He's like some kind of black Spock. He's just fucking... He's constantly doing something. That I'm thinking, when did you even have the time to do that? It's constantly working hard. And I think also the way that he dismantled fashion into art. You know, he just made this wonderful film called Eamon Brother and the Eamon Break, which is paying homage to the Eamon Break with Benji, who did the music. And of course, I got involved with Benji B. And him to make this, probably one of the greatest fashion 16-minute films I've ever seen. And I mean, I watched it the other day thinking, you fucking clever boy. I want to roll with people like that. Creative people. Because I remembered what happened when I started rolling with lesser gods. So I just end up fucking like wasting precious time. Of course, I always say this, but show me your friends and I'll show you your future. I like that. It's true, right? Yeah. I mean, I, 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 just, I, just, I just feel that something important's coming. You're already on it. I can see the twinkle in your eye. You've got it. You feel as if you, this is a masterpiece, probably going back to your, your timeless album. You feel something's brewing but you get that feeling now when people come up to you on a demo and you know nah they already they don't feel it themselves they're not confident about it but your whole life all the fucking pain the darkness and misery to then I feel as if your head's coming through the clouds for the very first time even though you probably felt it five years ago ten years ago you weren't there like them. you're feeling it now I can feel it I feel energies and presence and you're at a stage where you're coming through those that's whole life of fucking misery to then coming out and saying mm. I've not done it. You've not completed it. There's still a long way to go, but you're feeling probably more at calm and ease you've ever felt your whole life. How many kids have you got, Goldie? Five. And the one who's the one that's in prison for murder? Jamie. Yeah, Jamie. I spoke to Jamie yesterday. You know, there was a book called Soul Your Dad, which a dear friend told me about. It was about a father writing letters to his son. Jamie, bless him. You know, we, we laugh. Do you know what I mean? He's got another... He's got another 12. I'll be, yeah, he's not, no, no, he'll get out maybe in 10 because I'm, I'm going to be 64 when he gets out. And this is, this is a kid that was involved with the wrong people. 
Losing Jamie and a mother, let's not forget the two mothers that lost their son, both sons. Yeah, the victim, the one who's doing the sentence. Let's not forget that. Blessing said their family. Jamie's mom's never been the same. You know, and I, and I speak to Jamie and I, and, and, I, and I always say the time we should be having, I can't rub it in, but it was, it's like losing, it's like a, catching a beautiful blue marlin. You're in my, you know, you're in the sea and, you, and you, you've got this fucking fish on the end of a fucking big fishing rod and you're fucking pulling it in and you've got both feet on there and you've got the fucking belt on and you're pulling out the water and you can see this beautiful colour just coming to the surface, dying out the surface and you pull it out and the fucking line snaps and he just goes. I had him in London. I had him in Hertfordshire. I kind of had him. I had him right there in Hertfordshire. I had him right there and he was, he was looking after the Huskies. I had two beautiful Huskies, Bowie and Dylan. And I got a phone call, I was in America going, gee, the fucking Huskies have escaped. And I'm like, what do you mean? My fucking, Jamie's there. Ah, oh, he's gone, he's gone. And I, I phoned up and says, yeah, gee, uh, I got a phone call from another friend saying, listen, mate, we need to get your son out. He's gone. I said, what do you mean he's gone? He said, he's out, he's some guy. And the police are after him, he's on the run. I'm like, ah, oh, you've got six weeks to find him. We need to get him out. Let's get him, let's get him to Ireland. But he's gonna have to go missing for years. And then he just he never got in touch. I got back, had to sort all his shit out. But losing him, you know, but, and, it, and it's like, you can't take that time back. And, but that's of the generation where post-Cold Wars came in. And I'm thinking, post-Cold Wars in Wolverhampton, fucking hell. We used to go to Whitmarine, it's a breakdance. Or we'd have a little battle. It's just fucking the game done change. But when you start taking out that school, when that school got ripped out of that estate, and when those youth clubs changed, when you stopped those youth clubs in the UK, when you stopped the policing of youth clubs, you just kill the community, man. Mm -hmm. The fuck did you expect? What do you, what do you think was going to fucking happen? When these angry young kids have got nothing to do and they just start shotting and start doing everything else and start being fuck it and the drugs become harder and people start losing their shit and you're getting jacked. He was driving around in fucking cars, overweight cars with fucking still, overweight cars with steel bars, plates in the car because people are doing drive-bys and getting shot at. It's like, fuck off. And it ain't Oakland either. Do you know what I mean? But it's fucking bad. It got bad. Yeah, it must be tough because... You going down that road, do you count yourself blessed and lucky that you're not doing a life sentence? I got, there's a, there's a time when I was in a Rover and I had the, I had a shotgun there and I was going to fucking iron out a, an ex-girlfriend's and I was waiting for him, plotted up and the gun jammed and it would have been, I was just getting dicked. Do you know what I mean? I would have just, I was just dicking this bird and just playing me with another guy and I'm like, and I'm like, I'm, I'm going to fucking iron this fella out and it's just fucking jammed right at the wrong fucking time come out of the car with the ting, guys walking towards me, bam, click, fucking hell, just go. And I'm thinking, you fucking lunatic, you fucking idiot. What a dickhead. Because you've been stabbed a few times, have you not? Yeah, it's where you axed it here. It was a pickaxe and, you know, stabbed. But people, I know people, you know, there's some really dear friends, like the Manchester mob and, and Marlon and all those guys, beautiful people. Marlon did well. You know, he was, he was infamous in Manchester, Marlon. Lovely boy now. You know, changed his life around. Big man got a pub. He sees people coming in, you know, drowning their sorrows. And I love Marlon. You know, I, I based the character of this screenplay on Marlon. You know, and he dies really early. And I always remember my mate, even Ron, said to me, I read this thing and said, yeah, but you've got to change the name. I said, I ain't changing nothing. And he goes, and he didn't understand why. Marlon the gangster dies. The new Marlon lives. That's what you have to understand. You know, the, the whole idea of the catalyst of what the screenplay is about is every one of those people that really influenced because Marlon was fucking mad. He, you know, he blazing into a fucking nightclub with fucking shooting people, fucking mad. Shooting dogs on fucking security and just fucking lunatic. But a lot of people around him, there's a lot of death in his family. There's a lot of, in his life, I'm thinking, I had it fucking bad. Jesus Christ. 
You want to see his fucking life? There's a lot of people. You know, people go, oh my God, Goldie, your life's been so bad. Mate, I can name you a thousand people whose life is 10 times worse than mine's ever been. When you shine light on something, it's how much light do you want to carry on to shine for everyone else? Are you going to be prismatic? Are you going to realise before you send that demo, is it really good, mate? Do you not want to make it better? Because haven't you got enough examples of a great music to make it better? When you, you know, this bird came on my fucking feed. This is a few months back going, yeah, man, I, I paint Batman and Robin. I know I paint, ba I paint ba Batman and the Joker. I want you to tell me what you think. Um, okay, got me here. Um, it's Batman and Robin. Uh, how we know what they look like. Um, I I'm going to be your therapist now. Like, you okay, you know what? I'm going to tell you because you carried on sending me messages. You know what? It's Batman and Robin, and there is a lot of Batman and there's a lot of Batman and a lot of Joker pictures in the world. And to be fair, fair these aren't good. Oh, you're a complete cunt. Oh, I thought you were bad. It's like, yes, I don't care because you're asking me about Batman and Robin and Batman and fucking the Joker. It's shite. There's a lot better people doing better versions of it. You know, it's, so it's this thing. So everyone that's watching this. Please feel free to unfollow me. Because <laughs> it's, it's going to make your life easier and my life easier. Because the people that do follow me are real people. I've got some amazing people, whether it's Tina Baker, you know, a little paraplegic in a wheelchair that came to me at a festival. Proper facey little girl as well. You might, just because you can't speak fucking straight. Believe me, she can text fucking all right. She's facey and I love her. She's brilliant. That's real people. I love the fact that I've got people from all walks of life. I've got amazing people, amazing singers like Terry Walker and Natalie, and they're amazing in their own right. And I gravitate to creatures that have got the same amount of baggage. Our baggage kind of is the same. It's a bit heavyweight, this baggage, isn't it? Have you got a light version? Yeah, it took me a while to get hand luggage. You know, and, and we're the kind of people that travel with a light bag because we never know, you know, I, I know, and I wouldn't be around people too much because... I'm not going to be here for that long. And isn't that a great analogy? I'm not going to be here that long. I've got 10 years before I'm shitting, you know, 10 years, maybe 20 before I'm shitting in a bag. <laughs> and I've got 30 before I'm going to make no sense at all. I'm going to be back like I'm a fucking child. So spare me. And one thing that we spoke about, and I'm kind of going off on a tangent here, is I would much rather be on my way out doing ayahuasca. Because if there was ever, ever a mother of all drugs, she's not even a drug. The mother, an ayahuasca, is the medicine. It is nature's way of creating something which is the portal to one's own fucking existence. And all the people that throw stones from the glass house, I don't give a fuck about you lot. Because you're the ones that would rather stick fucking loads of morphine in me while I'm dying. And I don't care about you lot. I care, you know, I care about the power of what ayahuasca has done. Something that I avoided like a fucking plague. Why? Do, do you know what I mean? Why? Well, well, why? Because of the fear. Because I've got control on cocaine, haven't I? But with ayahuasca, like, oh, you're going to shit yourself and you're going to throw up. Oh, you're going to throw up and you're going to, you're going to, you're going to throw up skulls. <laughs> skull after skull after skull. And when you get to that level, you're going to go into this other level and you're going to see what the fuck? And you look at yourself and you think, I am not the person I thought I was. Because in that place, there is no right and wrong. And I actually understand that more than ever now. This isn't saying that, you know, that there is evil and good. There's just energy. And it's shifting from one place to another. What kind of energy do you want? Yeah. How do you... Is that how you've dealt with all your pain, your trauma? Is that all? Do you feel as if it's all coming to a head? Goldie? One of the biggest things for me was I, I think you know the Hoffman and ayahuasca. Is that what make you make I think changes? I think ayahuasca should be should be prescription. Why, do you, you, why do you think it's not? But uh, yeah, they'll prescribe. It's not because else. it's not me. You know, somebody posted something really good that you're about to make. You want us to take an experimental drug, i.e., vaccine. Um, that's not been tried and tested. But years ago, we were taking experimental drugs in clubs and yeah. you wanted to arrest us for it. But now you wanted to take an ex experimental drug and not go to a club. <laughs> it's yeah. like, hello. Um, 
Ayahuasca is the mother. It comes from nature. Everything is like when you see aloe vera packaged in a fucking plant. It's natural. I mean, Thailand, just cut it off and use it, right? It's part of, it's the DNA. It's it's sequentially the nearest thing for us that is right. And pharmaceutical companies know that. Of course they do. But they're scared and riddled in fear because that is the mother. There's There's nothing more challenging than someone that wants to be effeminate and, you know, really find yourself mm-hmm. and I know that you're going to be doing a big project around ayahuasca which I think is involved, and, and yeah. I'm hoping I'm, you know that's something we can work out mm-hmm. I have done a lot of, of drugs cocaine has been my my drug and believe me the fear of ayahuasca was running far more rampant than even a librarian ever wanted to touch it because of the control factor believe me ayahuasca for me was the future have you been in the White House have you been in the White House the White House, no. No, I read something, man. I thought that like, you got a plane to the president of the White House or something. Oh, you mean, okay, the story comes yeah. from. Yeah, we were about to go to the White House. It was very weird. That was a very weird, that was very, that was very loud, oh. Um, <laughs> it was just a surreal moment. There's been so many surreal moments in my life, like ultra surreal. Yeah, it was Val Kilner, the actor. He wanted to be around me when I was playing music and listen to what I played. And and there's a guy called Josh Evans, who's one of my best friends. Josh Evans is Robert Evans' son. And Robert Evans is the greatest Hollywood producer ever. I mean, this kid remembers when his dad's hooker girl, big tits, bikini, is driving him in a Trans Am from school. (laughs) Comes up to the driveway. She can't get it in the fucking garage underneath the house. And, he, and he's sitting there with his school bag. And she can't get it on the driveway. She leaves it on the driveway. Josh gets out of the car. She gets a little Josh gets out. They go in the car and the fucking car blows up. Now, if that had been inside the house, thank God women can't drive. Because, sorry, um, the car blows up. And it was an assassination. They said it was the mafia. So I'm rolling with his son, who is a fucking weed fanatic. So imagine me and him, I'm, got, I'm on gear all fucking day long and he's on fucking weed. It's like, this is a really bad du- duet, right? And we're, you know, we're at the, you know, it's when I say to my ex-manager, Trenton, where did it go wrong for me in America? He went, I'll tell you where it went wrong. I asked George, I see his manager, just to babysit you for one day that I couldn't make it. And what do you do, George? You let Goldie go fucking town on this guy, the head of K-Rock, and tell him to go fuck himself with Josh. And I literally told them to go fuck themselves. So the, the idea of going back to the point, Val Kino was in LA and he's like, look, we're all going to New York. We've been invited to the White House. And uh, Clinton had invited him. And I'd fucking been on the rampage all night in LA. And I'm like, fuck, I missed the plane. And I get a phone call from Josh. He's in, he's, he's in Washington. He's going, yo, man. I'm calling us, where are you? Because I'm at the White House and Bill Clinton's like 24 away from me. He says, you should have been here, man. You should, you missed the fucking plane. I'm like, yeah, man, but I'm hanging out at the back of some bitch. I'm all, I'm all right with it. But it was weird because they're in the White House and it would have been, it's just a surreal moment for me that, you know, they, they were trying to court me and try, I just didn't care. But then I think that it come back to LA and, and there was a fascination, a weird twisted fascination with Val Kilner that he, he'd had, first time I'd met him, he had like shout out Mau Mau, room 1010 where Belushi died. He had a fixation of this place. Dark. Oh, it was very dark energy in that room. Mm-hmm. I'd, I'd got into that room and he's got candles lit everywhere. And I'm thinking, he's fucking gonna try and bum me or something. Like, you know what I mean? <laughs> but Josh is there and there's a few of the guys there and I'm like, is someone going to be at a sacrificial fucking lamb next? And it was weird because I'm sitting there. He's like, oh, man, tell me about Timeless. How you made this thing. You know, you can just go like, people want to fucking have courtship with you and just tell him this shit, right? And he's fucking mad because he's got this idea about doing this film and all of a sudden the phone rings and it's fucking Ted Turner on the phone. And it's like, yo, say, hold on a second. Goldie, speak to Ted. And he's passing me the phone. He's like, you know, I'm listening to a mogul, Ted Turner, on the fucking phone, thinking, this kid from Wolverhampton's doing all right, isn't he? <laughs> so all of these mad, I mean, you know, this is just the mad stories. There's a thousand of those mad stories, whether it's, you know, 
Lucci Luciano's, you know, Lucky Luciano's fucking mansion, James Addiction, end of tour. Fucking midgets running around with fucking silver trays. I mean, I've done it all. But have I? All that stuff. I think, I think the rock and roll ended when the internet became connectable. All the stuff I see now is a lot of fucking hype. There's a lot of things that would not survive now that are surviving because of yeah. the internet. And there's lots of good things that are thriving because of that. Um, but I, I do think that all of the mad stories, all of the mad stuff, that, that it, it's, it's like fucking up. This is the stuff of folklore, some of this stuff. Yeah. Where do you go now then, brother? Through all the madness, the trauma, the pain, the darkness. I know you've got this six part thing coming up that's your kind of focus well, I think, yeah, really hard on. I think the gallery, the gallery, you know, we've got through COVID. The gallery, or any of you guys want to check out Aurum, it's Aurum at Art Gallery. So it's Aurum Art Gallery. It's a beautiful space. It's the first thing people say when they walk into the gallery. They go, oh my God, this space. Because, you know, we've got, we got sick of having small contemporary where it's all a bit claustrophobic. And there's some amazing artists in there. You know, I mean, it's phenomenal. All my artist friends from around the world, you know, whether it's Vils, you know, Mad C, uh, Berlin, uh, Saturno, Bio, myself. You know, there's some amazing artists in, in this place. And I think the gallery, when we open back up, is having guest artists to, to be there. I think this week we're dropping Voider's new work. He was a prolific artist from, from Brighton called Voida. Amazing stuff. Um, and just this screenplay, I, 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 just, I just feel something magical. I, I, I'm, I'm almost like, I just don't want the world to end before I finish it in this weird way. When you've, when you've gone this far, believe me, I'm not, I'm not in the, I've gone through the conspiracy thing. I've only got a certain amount of time. Do you feel that? Yeah. There's a, I think there's a fascination with Virgos, Virgoians. My fascination with time, not having enough. Uh, it's throughout my life, even before Timeless, I was doing pictures of watches and I've got time on there, but they've got hair on the canvas thinking, fucking hell, this is really Freudian. You've always fascinated with time. I always lose watches. Brightlings, I've lost fucking five of them. Must be. Philip Chirol's in fights, just comes off your wrist. Some fucker out there has got my Philip Chirol. Some fucker out there has got my Brightly. I mean, there's a lot of watches I've lost. And it's just weird. I find the fact, I think what's next is, A, I'm not going to go to space because it's too expensive because somebody's already done it and it cost me 27 billion. How much was that trip? Yeah, it was fucking nice. I mean, I, yeah. I mean... Yeah, it was, it was hundreds of millions. It was a lot of money. Yeah. And I, I think that's probably one of the... I think the biggest cunt award goes to that. That's a cuntish thing to do. Um, I kind of get it. I don't mind, you know, even Branson's skimming space a little bit and spending a bit of that. But doing this, that's, I'm not going to go to space. And also, humans can't live in space because that's where negative energy comes from. And we implode, note to self. And our ancestors used to live there. On, you know, Mars is like a fucking, it's an old fucking gaff we used to live at. It's mm -hmm. gone. So, I mean, old it's, house party. It's an old fucking house party, guys. Yeah. I mean, we're... You know, where's your reading on it? We used to go inhabit, yes, you know. And I always, I always get that weird thing when people start talking about, oh God, here we go with aliens. We are aliens. What do you think we are? We are a manifestation of power, energy in the universe that's manifested itself in one consciousness. We're heading towards the, the one. And when I say that, Bowie, a dear friend of mine summed it up when he did the Jeremy, when he did the Blackstone interview, the Paxton interview, that music and resonance is puts us into the one. And no longer is the DJ, you know, superstar DJs, fuck off. The idea that the DJ is resonating with you and the sound and rave culture. Where do we come from? We are the manifestation of a very, of, a, of an infinite universe in infancy. I believe that the universe Firstly, before you come to me, you have to get your head around infinity. And if you can't do that, and the reason why a lot of humans struggle is because we are in a timeline of zero, zero, zero to whenever the fuck you're out of here. Beyond that peripheral vision, either side of that, is something called infinity. The idea that there is no time. If you can understand that, just get your head around it for a fucking second. Because again, 
here comes your self-worth. And every time you do it, you're getting shorter and shorter. The idea that you're entitled to think that you're going to rule everything and that the science is going to make it a little bit longer so you can live longer. Yes, you will create science to make you live longer. Yes, we can create stuff. And in the end, maybe we can live forever. Well, where's the soul? 21 grams. The soul is a living entity which is maturing in the oneness of the universe. Maybe infinity is a child. Positive energy exploded. That's negative. That's evil. That's wrong. That's on. That's not a bad trip. That's not me having lots of gag and going, I don't think I'm out anymore. That's negative energy. So the idea of ayahuasca and everything opening you up and moving forward. Positive energy explodes. Negative energy implodes. Hello? It doesn't take rocket science to understand it. Adolf was a great guy, but he's a bad cunt. But he was still a great man in his way that he had this great vision. And he did it. Just negative energy he did it with. But what, his energy might have been good in the beginning, but it kind of went a little bit fucking shit-faced. And people go, oh, well, guys, we are, we, England is the Germans. We are an extension of the German family. Hello? Don't start me off. It's all about the energy. What about... Anybody that's watching, brother, that's maybe going through a battle themselves, maybe what advice would you give for them? I think the advice for anyone that's going through mental illness right now, what we do today creates tomorrow. That's another quite great quote of mine. It's a yoga quote, you're a gangster. I must give love to Kelly, my sister in New York. I fucking hate yoga. Well, if you say you hate yoga, you hate union. This is what it means. Just get yourself up and say, you know what, let's just plan it. Tomorrow, I'm going to go and do this. Well, okay, well, that's tomorrow, but that's not here yet. If you can just be spontaneous on one day, you're just going to go, right, I'm going. I'm going to go, I'm going to go to yoga. I'm going to go and meditate in the field. I'm going to go for a 10K walk. Be in the present, just do it. Just, just, just do it once and then just do it twice. I fucking hate walking up hills. I fucking love it now. I only did it a year ago. I'm 55. You know, it's never too late. You're never too old. You're never too late to just go. The, the biggest killer in males, in, in males over 40 are the most suicidal fucks. You know why? Because males are too proud. Fuck it, I'll just top myself, it's easier. They're forgetting the amount of pain they're leaving behind. Do you know what, I'm thinking about topping myself. I am. How can you help me? This isn't like taking loads of pills when you were a kid and you go, I've got my stomach pumped out, I did that. Cry for help. Do you know what I mean? You're gonna fucking top yourself. I never fucking knew he was gonna do that. Uh, well, that's what topping yourself does. If you're gonna do it, do it, you know what I mean? There's also, there's also something very brave in that. Bit selfish, you cunt. But so my advice to any people, any people that are, if you're feeling this way, get it out. I don't want you to leave the planet, brother or sister. And if you feel so fucked up about it, just maybe we're not listening right. Tell me your pain. And I think that when they see this stuff, go to yoga, EMDR treatment, go to a place you've never been to before. Sit in a park alone with your hands crossed and just think about your life. Think about the good times you've had. They're not all bad. And, and my advice to any younger person, that's just older people that are really struggling with mental illness. And the younger people, mate, if I had 44, I was 44 before I walked into a yoga studio. I'm Paul Dobson, who I love to this day. Love that boy, you see. Jamaican from Leicester. Bad man, you see. Paul's just like, listen, go to yoga, man. I remember turning up at yoga in Clipstone Street, opposite Radio 1. And I walked in there and I'm, everyone's looking at me, man. It's like, and they're all clocking me. I'm like, fucking. I tried it one years before that and I walked out. I'm sitting down and I'm thinking, fuck, why is everyone fucking staring at me? Well, you're fucking well known, you come. What more did you want? And I'm sitting down and it's 20 minutes in and I'm fucking baked. I'm like, fuck all this, I'm gone, man. I'm not gonna just fucking stay here. Fucking shit. Fucking all your bollocks. 
Oh, there's his ego. No control. Blame it on everything else but himself. Came back a week later. Again, same thing. Lasted 30 minutes this time. And I always remember Paul, third time, Paul pulls me aside and he goes, JJ, do me a favour, mate. I know you've got a lot going on. I can see. I can see it. It's like, leave your ego at the door next time you come in here. Just leave it there. Leave your ego at the door. You'll be better off. Fucking, he said, oh, oh, all right. Kind of got my head around it. Yeah, leave my ego at the door. And I, I started listening to what you're saying. And I, yeah, I started staying in the lesson. And I got to like 40 minutes, 50, and I got to an hour. And I think I fucking got this. It's five or six years into yoga. I was still using heavily and doing yoga. Fucking like, what the fuck's going on? Friday come, oh, the reward's coming. Saturday, Sunday, back to square one. It's killing me. It's just fucking killing me. Trying to find the balance. And then it just clicked. And so my advice to people, I mean, hot yoga because I like clubs. It's like a nightclub. I, like, I guess it's, I gravitated to it because of that. Also, I guess, you know, doing other things like vinyasa is good. Light vinyasa, heavy vinyasa. Because obviously it's not as uh, organized, you know, with regimental as, as the, two, the 26 and 2. But I think I need that kind of discipline. I like the 26 and 2 because it's discipline for me. But my advice to anyone is do something you haven't done. Um, go beyond social media in the way that what it is. It's a tool. It's only a fucking thing. And if these are people's real thoughts, what are they thinking when they're not on social media as well? I mean, the thought process of going out to do yoga or getting up to do something. We spend a lot of time thinking and scrolling. And I think you have to get yourself out of that mentality. I like being in the field. I didn't want to get up today, but I fucking had to. Yeah, I was supposed to be going to fucking <laughs> hot yoga yeah. with you, and I was, I was at six in the morning, and then I spoke <laughs> to you, I done, brother, I'm a no show, sorry. No, but you know, I think that's, you see, the thing is, well, we'll do it again. Definitely, but next you know, week. But you see, part of, you see that, why I didn't bust your balls? Because part of that doubt was the fact that you didn't hear from me. Yeah. And what you've got to understand is, part of the support for this, it's like a different type of rehab. I'm not gonna babysit you. No. I'll be there at 6.30 tomorrow. And when you start getting the doubt, it's not the doubt in, in my mind, it's the doubt in your mind. Yeah, definitely. And I think part of this is, you know, with like, with Ron or something like that, I said, Ron, if you ain't outside your house at 10 past, I'm gone. Mm -hmm. And bringing myself to a place where I'm so happy to be, you're not gonna come out of yoga and go, fucking, that's the worst thing I've fucking done. I feel sh I should never have gone. All we have to do as human beings, turn up. Yeah, that's, a, that's what I believe anyway. But I never turned up today, but I'll make up for it next week. Brother, for coming on today and telling your story, we've, we've not even scratched the surface of a lot of stuff, but that's two hours of people. Was will that two hours? Yeah, we'll take a lot from this. And a phenomenal achievement, kid from Wolverhampton, to then <laughs> obviously been in mega films, best-selling albums, winning awards, and your music's there for eternity, like... It's a phenomenal achievement and a phenomenal career. And I know a lot of people look to you as inspiration as well. And the stuff that you're doing now to then making better changes, fighting your demons and really fucking facing them head on. That's where people get their inspiration. And, and I'm genuinely grateful for you, brother. Thank you. And um, no doubt we'll do this again. Well, let's get ice in. I mean, so that's the one thing I'm missing is the old ice bath. And I know that you do yeah, that yourself. Thought, yeah. It's brilliant. Yeah. I mean, stuff like that. There is there is something that I'm getting involved in in a... Uh, Lake District, it's a, it's a cold water swim. I'll do it. And it's a, there's, a, there's a place up there yeah. where you go and do this open, open water swims mm -hmm. and stuff. That's I'm where I want to be. That, God bless you, brother. God bless you, See brother. You later. Thank you. Cheers. Check out more of my podcasts on the right. And be sure to like, share and comment your thoughts on this week's podcast. Thank you.